Hey, hey, what's up, man? Not much. How you doing? Exhausted, but yep. I'm handling it. How much have you been sleeping? <laughs> barely. Just barely. <laughs> Yesterday, I, I was pretty sure I slept well until I realized that I slept only three hours. And <laughs> that was a bad realization. <laughs> I think I've been averaging about 100 hours of work a week minimum for the last two months, so yeah quite crazy it's it's crazy times for sure and just the you know the the good thing about this and i'm a workaholic and i've i've used to uh, to be working a lot but this time it at least makes sense you yep. know? <laughs> um anyway uh yeah i mean very glad that you know you took the initiative to start this whole community it's uh, been incredible to see it come together um you know i think i've been a little bit distant um you know working on my own stuff but uh also working on stuff with uh jogal i don't know if you're aware of jogal no um, what's that so just one giant lab is a, another community um uh, mostly uh the organizers are out of france but uh it's global at this point and uh they're a little bit more uh, kind of diverse in terms of the projects that they're handling. So they've got everything from uh, teams developing NEB LAMP uh, tests where they're, you know, sending primers to each other and, uh, you know, figuring out if there's a way to make a uh, scalable, accurate NEB LAMP test um, all the way to, you know, a guy who's trying to make a coronavirus library, um, including like, you know, personal accounts and all sorts of information for historical sake. So there's a whole diversity of projects there. Um, but, nice. uh, basically, uh, you know, there's a bunch of data science related things, including like CoEpi and, uh, uh, OpenDemic and some of these other projects around contact tracing and things like that have teams that are there interfacing with people. Um, my project, uh, building a epidemiological modeling toolkit is, uh, focused there. Um, there's a bunch of complexity researchers, you know, some people in, involved with like, uh, the Bell Labs Complexity Institute or uh, nice. Institute of Complexity Research in Paris and various other people. Um, so it's been super helpful as a community to uh, get all of those really, you know, hardcore science people um, and math people uh, together. So I was literally our... sharing an article about Bell Labs. Uh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Um, it's interesting now that it's actually like a global thing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not like it's still taking form of this ivory tower with the factory uh, in the basement, but it's now global. And yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that I would consider it an ivory tower as much uh, these days. Um, you know, uh, I think the influence of things like the Santa Fe Institute of Complexity Research and other places like that um, has made it so that uh, you know, some of these other institutes are a little bit more open. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's still very much, you know, the top of the field people. Um, but, you know, uh, most of them are quite friendly and open with their research. And, you know, uh, it's been really interesting to engage with them. But um, yeah. Uh, so as I was saying, uh, you know, I haven't been involved too much with CoronaWide to this point. And, you know, over the last couple of days, I've, I'm sure you've seen that I've been uh, taking more interest and in trying to, you know, just help uh, provide my perspective on things and see if it can help you guys, you know. Which is super helpful. Like, honestly, you you keep mentioning that uh, you're, you don't have ability to participate in full capacity, but trust me, like the, the things that you've been posting are definitely influencing like pretty good chunk of people to to change their pers perspectives or at least think differently. Yeah, um, and that's I mean, what this uh, this is all about. Like yeah, literally, the there is an open community, right? Like, yeah, a bunch of perspectives together, and you know, it's not ever going to be the case that one person is entirely right, and I'm happy when I'm wrong because it means that I've learned something. We're uh, mostly wrong all the time, by the yeah. way. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, just like getting this diverse set of perspectives together is, is very useful. Um, but um, no, I think it is the case that you guys are starting to congregate a little bit more around, you know, not just you know, mission and values, but actually vision. Um, 
And so uh, it made sense for me to step in a little bit and uh, kind of help that process along now that it's the self-organization process has gotten a little bit further. Um, so, you know, a little bit of my background beyond, you know, just the LinkedIn um, kind of uh, the way that I think about myself is that uh, most of my career has been spent just embedding very deep on very specific domains and uh, figuring out how to cross apply, you know, statistical techniques and data engineering techniques and uh, complex systems thinking and systems modeling across those different domains. So, um, you know, my initial research was in sound um, and uh, also like uh, graph theory related things. Um, and then I actually started a beer analytics company at one point. Um, so it was a lot of recommender systems in NLP. Then I moved to another NLP startup doing uh, social media NLP, um, went to Palantir, did some things that I can't talk about. <laughs> um, that we're all fully totally you know, understood. Uh, not not bad things, but just uh, you know uh, confidential things. Yep. Um, and then I re ran data science and data engineering for about three years at a startup trying to basically uh, make sense of web traffic in the context of predicting uh, geopolitical events and financial events. Um, and then for the last two years, I've been doing a lot of consulting across a lot of different industries. Um, from everything from uh, developing like uh, uh, GPU based uh, video editing uh, plugins for uh, special effects um, to working with travel tech and a bunch of other industries. Um, That's and so, quite di diverse experience. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, uh, kind of my whole MO over this period has been developing the skill set of becoming, you know, approximately a domain expert very, very quickly. Um, you know, learning enough to know what I don't know um, and yeah. learning enough to know who I should ask about the things that I don't know. Um, and then, you know, uh, understanding similarities between different domains and different techniques and, uh, you know, uh, not just getting compartmentalized into deep learning or into Bayesian statistics or into, you know, uh, ETL versus modern data engineering or any of these, you know, things that are related, but uh, don't necessarily talk well Meaningless together. by itself. Let's call it that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, you know, I, I think you expressed some interest in causal inference and causal modeling. Um, and kind of my thought on this is that, you know, what I'm trying to drive home is that there are actually several different products that need to be built here. Um, and given the skill set that the team currently has, um, it makes sense to focus on a subset of them. Um, you know, there are a couple of people with ontology backgrounds, there's a couple of people with medical backgrounds, things like that, um, where some sort of knowledge engineering would be possible. Um, but for the most part, it seems like the expertise is in natural language processing, right? Um, you know, we have some like very solid people in weird domains. Like there is this guy, psycholinguist, uh, Mark, not sure if you've interacted with him, but he has very good, like this kind of mindset about the language that is not necessarily NLP, but like whenever he talks, I mostly like, I listen and I'm like, I definitely need to catch up on yeah. these things. And that's a good qualifier for me to kind of, you know, understand that this person is talking about something interesting because like if it's, you know, just something plain or like deep learning or like bird something, like I, I understand most of it sure. and I'm like, okay. But whenever it's some like granularity exploration type of, uh, you know, research. Yeah. I mean, it's the difference between, you know, applied science and fundamental science, right? Like I'm sure he's at the point of being a linguist where he's thinking about context-free grammars and all these things in like syntactic sense and, um, Whereas, you know, uh, BERT is basically an attempt to abstract that away by using large amounts of data and discover that latently. Um, and that's but, why I, I basically, when that ARC challenge was posted and Francois Cholet uh, wrote that paper, that 60 page uh, paper, I got excited because truthfully, like I, again, like I believe that we, we still haven't uncovered the full potential of the statistical representation uh, type of solutions and models, like even BIRD and others. But I do believe that there is, 
there is another layer to it and something that is preventing us from hitting that, uh, you know, abstract reasoning and basically the application of uh, intelligence that lies beyond giant data sets. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that there's a whole nother g jump to, you know, general AI past, uh, you know, the ability to do causal, re causal reasoning or anything like that. Um, you know, the ability to generalize is very, very, very hard. Um, you know, we've seen some advances in that with, you know, uh, some deep learning approaches and things like that, but um, there's a whole bunch of different, you know, areas that we're pushing into in terms of, um, it, you know, knowledge representation, knowledge learning, and, uh, you know, uh, structurally modeling and all these different things where, uh, I don't know, uh, have you kept up with uh, Wolfram in the last two weeks or so? Oh, I've seen that giant uh, graph representation or something. Uh, yeah. I mean, he was super excited about sharing it. Truthfully, I haven't understood anything. Like, I looked at it and I was like, wow, cool. <laughs> yep. um, so just the, you know, layman's version of that work is that, um, you know, Wolfram as a determinist believes that everything, you know, can be modeled, you know, yeah. exactly. Um, and uh, he's come upon this abstraction of uh, essentially substitution graphs um, or substitution rules where, uh, you know, a uh, graph of connected components can rearrange itself in some way or add something to it or whatever based on some simple rule set. Um, and then he applied a bunch of causal modeling techniques um, to show that basically every, every physics theory that we have so far come up with um, has some sort of formulation based on these like two very simple building blocks. Um, and yeah, it's, it's super inspiring. Um, there's a lot of work to still be done there, but uh, it kind of points to this direction of, you know, maybe it is the case that a lot more things should be uh, thinking about things in terms of uh, causal inference. Um, yeah. The same thing's been happening in the other side of things of, you know, Wolfram being the super, super abstract phys physics person um, to, uh, I don't know, like uh, Ferenc from inference.bc um, uh, who works currently at Twitter, I think. Um, and like David Bly and these other thinkers of, um, you know, who have a mix of some theoretical ap application based, um, theoretical versus application based thinking, um, where a lot of them have been over the last couple of years being sucked up by, uh, you know, industrial titans like Facebook. Yeah. Kid. Um, but they've found through that, that, you know, in industry, causality is actually super important, right? You want to know if I intervene in this way, uh, what will happen? If I had done this differently, what would have happened? Um, and so uh, these people who had previously been thinking about, you know, probabilistic graphical models and deep learning and uh, kind of, you know, just uh, things on top of Markov ran random fields and things like that are now thinking more in terms of uh, directed acyclic graphs and uh, like do calculus and all these causal things. Oh, uh, actually, speaking of Dukakos, have you read this book, The Book of Why? Uh, so I haven't read Book of Why, but I've read uh, Judea Pearl's two other more technical. Um, okay, because I haven't read it yet, and that's on my list. I just don't have any time to read it. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah the Dukakos is is pretty good idea. I mean, yeah, it's it's exciting for sure. It needs new notation, but. It's, it's an interesting idea, um, but um, yeah. Uh, so, you know, what I'm thinking with, uh, uh, you know, what I've seen of the skill sets in kernel Y and, you know, it's not exhausted by any means. There's a lot of people that I haven't interacted with, um, but just based on the energy and, you know, the people who have been really working hard so far, uh, kind of my expectation is that, um, you know, uh, the first product should really be that literature review product. Yes. Um, and let me give you a thing. Uh, sorry for interrupting you. I'm, I'm just uh, sometimes in the past three weeks, I get people faster than they try to explain themselves. And I operate on this ultra speed mode. And I try to give more context to actually like Im improve the speed of conversation. So I'll, I'll try to do that. So today we had a call with epidemiologists. Oh, okay. Um, 
so I'll, I'll make some separate points on that, but I, I have the full context there. Don't worry about it. Perfect. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I watch most videos on 2x speed so that I can just get a bunch of information. In. I wish 3x existed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I already have watched the call with search. Um, you know, uh, I think that he had some really interesting points. Um, I will say that uh, there needs to be some work decomposing what epidemiology actually is. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of different areas of epidemiology, especially when it comes to infectious disease epidemiology. Um, so, you know, uh, I think Serge's uh, background, from what I understand, is more in the pharmaceutical space, which is separate from and uh, here's, that's the perception that you get immediately, right? But he actually left epidemiology to focus more on like pharma stuff and market research stuff because he basically wasn't able to fulfill himself as a professional in epidemiology. So yes, I would say that he's, his recent and most recent experience and biases come from that. But he has some solid background in, in the public health and and social sciences, which also is not like, he's not the best person in that space. And I recognize that. And I think he recognizes it too. Yeah. Um, you know, even from his first conversation with you, I think he was talking about epidemiologists as they, because that's kind of his former life. Right? Yep. Um, and beyond that though, it's still the case that there is a distinction between, you know, different types of epidemiology, right? Like you've got, uh, you know, the complex systems epidemiologists who think about networks and, uh, you know, uh, stochastic systems and state space modeling and causal reasoning and all these things. You've got, uh, you know, people who are in the intersection of uh, public health surveillance and epidemiology, um, where, you know, uh, they're doing things like trying to collect data and design new studies to collect data in useful ways. Um, you've got people who are you know, focused specifically on transmission. Um, you've got people who are more on the virology side and thinking about like within host dynamics. You've got this whole ecosystem, um, kind of the way Do that- you have uh, ontology of that somewhere? Uh, not a very good one. Um, I could try to put one together. Um, I think that would be like the best thing that you could do in terms of pointing the direction and some structure that is crucially missing from the current like search engine or any other places, just because no one knows what epidemiology is and no one understands how complex that is as a subject. Yeah, I mean, the way that I would think about it is that uh, I actually <laughs> wrote a little tweet storm about this other, the other day, but um, essentially, if you think about rocket science, you know, you've got avionics, you've got fluid dynamics, you've got material science, you've got all these different subcomponents of rocket science. Um, epidemiology is the same thing, um, but it even goes further where, you know, uh, pharmaceutical epidemiology versus infectious disease epidemiology versus nutrition epidemiology all have their own subspecialties. Um, and they, to some degree, speak a common language, but a lot of the time their approaches are pretty different. Um, and so really, you know, in terms of building a general purpose tool that can be used moving forward, um, it is the case that, you know, uh, thinking about these more uh, like non-infectious disease use cases uh, is probably useful. Um, but I think for now it would be uh, really beneficial to focus on, you know, because it's Corona Y, uh, yeah. how can we support the people who are doing things related to infectious disease? Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to try to put together a small ontology uh, around that or an explainer of some sort. Um, yeah, just one pager, I think, would be sure. good. Sure. Um, okay. Go ahead. But uh, some thoughts around some of the nuance there. Um, you know, uh, Serge mentioned that uh, a lot of these epidemiologists don't have the time to actually do uh, the full lit review and go in and read the paper and make a decision as to whether or not this is you know, something that they should actually be using or not. Um, I think that's true in some cases, uh, but uh, there's kind of a competition between the fact that they don't have the time to do that and the fact that they do need to do that in mm -hmm. the infectious disease space where, you know, even, uh, you know, uh, reputable journals like The Lancet or something like that, um, a lot of them, you know, have relaxed their uh, peer review requirements. Um, or even prior to that, it was still the case that, you know, 
um, a lot of things get published that, you know, make a bunch of assumptions that, uh, you know, if it's taken out of context, um, then it becomes a case that it's not actually used in a valid way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when it comes to infectious disease epidemiology, as much as possible, these people need to uh, fully understand the context of the, the paper that uh, provides a result. It's not just the case that, you know, incubation time is a fixed number, right? Yeah. It's distribution. And that distribution is conditioned on, you it's, know, demographics and genetics and age and pre-existing conditions and all these things. It's um, the thing that we, I at least try to claim as between the lines stuff. I think it's not even between the lines. It is the, the thing, right? Um, with simple models, right? Like people will try to use a single value um, or potentially like a confidence interval or interquartile range, right? Um, some of the reason they do that is because the data doesn't exist and the processes to come up with the full distribution, um, you know, the empirical distribution um, or condition in the right ways or anything like that is, you know, basically writing your own thesis and yeah. there's no mechanisms to do that. Um, so, I mean, uh, like, what is the name of the project? Um, there's uh, a uh, R-based project of a bunch of epidemiologists who are trying to make uh, kind of small toolkits for uh, like doing some of these parameter estimations based on, you know, okay, we, we think that it's probably gamma distributed and we have an IQR, so let's figure yeah. out what the gamma distribution is. Um, and some of those tools will be super useful. Um, you know, maybe some future iteration of the product can bring that kind of stuff in. Um, but really what I think is uh, helpful for the people who are, you know, the experts who are trying to supply that single number um, to the people who don't have the time um, is the ability to synthesize these different estimates of a property. Um, so, you know, uh, I don't know if you saw that Kaggle, um, like the one that Kaggle came out with. Of, Findings, uh, the contributions page? No, um, or yeah, the, the Kaggle community contributions page mm -hmm. from, from Kaggle where, you know, uh, incubation period had like 35 different values, right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of those don't even overlap in terms of confidence interval. Um, if we could build a tool that, you know, qualifies those and says, all right, like this is more recent information or this, you know, sample size is larger here, or this specifically has to do with 65 year olds and over, or, um, this is outdated. This is like not even humans <laughs> and things yeah. like that. Um, then it becomes the case that it becomes much easier for these people who are trying to come up with, okay, like, uh, there are people who are just plugging this into a model as like a single number or three values. Um, what number should they have? Um, those people still need to go in and actually do the full lit review of understanding, okay, what are the uh, potential flaws with this study? How does it relate to the rest of the, the body of work? Um, you know, maybe it's the case that, uh, you know, this is conducted in a country that's using a test that has less precision than uh, you know, the rest of the population. Um, so they need to make all these sorts of caveats and understand like, okay, how do we synthesize this in some reasonable way? Um, and that is a separate task in my mind and is really kind of more of what my project is trying to do. Um, so, you know, the idea with my project is that a, uh, someone who's interested in contributing to this process of coming up with better estimates or better distributions for these things um, would submit a paper, um, pull in, you know, here's the values that they came up with. Um, and then an automated system on top of that would be like, all right, like if we say that, that, that that's the value, then these other 15 studies that are currently in our knowledge graph, um, you know, no longer line up with reality in some way. Um, give this kind of, uh, a, causal chain of like, mm -hmm. all right, like this interacts with this other variable in some way. Um, so that can't be the reality or, uh, you know, uh, this value of the specific parameter conflicts directly with this other study. Um, therefore, you know, we need to have someone go in and resolve that as an expert and say, Oh, this one, this study is actually 
more correct or here's the problem with this study and how we should counterweight it for bias. Um, yeah, and I mean, the point that you're bringing up is, is really powerful and the fact that many you know, ML or AI researchers often miss out is the fact that data by itself doesn't really mean anything. And the information happens to hold knowledge only to specific observer and not to get, you know, too crazy in like quantum mechanics and all of that st stuff. But what we're really doing is we can build, you know, all kinds of relationship graphs or anything like that. But it's really up to the human in the loop to define the information and knowledge and whatever we can do to simplify that process, like we should. So I'm a hundred percent aligned on that. Um, let's, let's think how to make it easier to understand to our community, because the stuff that you're talking about is insanely complex. Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> That's kind of been my, my experience um, with life in general. Um, <laughs> I feel you, man. <laughs> um, you know, it is the case that I do have some experience communi communicating these things in simpler ways. Um, you know, one of my projects, for example, was uh, taking humans' uh, understanding of constraints, like uh, this can't be next to this other thing, or these things have to be these far, this far away. Um, and translating that into something that an optimization procedure could um, directly maintain as constraint. Um, so, you know, I, I think, you know, if it is the case that the level of technicality that I'm using is, you know, a little too high, um, I can definitely uh, try to simplify things a little bit and structure it a little bit more. Um, and just honest feedback. Uh, again, we're all like radically transparent and radically honest here. Like, it is too high and people that are looking at your messages, they are kind of, maybe there are a couple of people that understand what you're talking about. Some people understand, but are lost in terms of like, okay, so what's next? And there is a, a biggest, probably 80% of people that read through it and don't understand anything. Fair enough. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, let's figure out, the, the good thing that I think I can uh, try to communicate is this, you know, basically the feedback that you just gave on the epidemiologist, uh, the, the call is the fact that we should start with that literature review stuff for a number of reasons. Um, and we can explain those, but also explaining this example of Kaggle contributions page and why it doesn't make any sense um, and how to, to actually produce something meaningful for people in need of it and bring up the, the human in the loop thing. So how about like you, you start with that ontology and maybe, I don't know, like preface, like why your idea, your project makes sense. And then we try to organize kind of a, a brainstorming call around it because I feel we can cherry pick people that will resonate very well, that are not really engaged yet for a number of reasons, because the problems that we were solving were not fit, or there was, you know, loss of context. And there are so many, like even NLP researchers that are out of the context of what we're currently doing, just for the reason of failing to optimize the task to people. You know what I mean? Um. Yeah, definitely hear that. And, you know, there are also, you know, the casual observers who probably won't uh, engage very much at all um, at any point. But um, yeah, I think that there is also, you know, just based on my observations of some of the calls and whatnot, um, uh, I think there are several people that, you know, I hear their ideas and I hear them not being willing to speak up as loudly um, yeah. as I have. Um, and like, example being Slava, right? Like he's been doing such incredible work. Um, but it's also the case that like, you know, uh, not to call Brendan out, but uh, you know, when Slava was like, hey, like this is not actually what semantic search is. Uh, Brendan was like, no, it is. Um, where, you know, Slava did his master's thesis in 
search engines 18 years ago. <laughs> um, and has been doing it for 20 years, which yeah. is like, I'm still catching up to the power that Slava has and like his productivity and all of that. It's just amazing. I barely understand some of the things that he's trying to accomplish. And I'm just, you know, watching that. But he's also talking about some of the things that you were describing, which is basically the basic like entity relationship uh, graphs and building that infrastructure, because that essentially enables all kinds of NLP researchers to make a much more productive work. Yeah. And, you know, there are ways to approach this from kind of the semantic web ontology perspective. And there's also ways to approach it from more of the statistical machine learning, deep learning um, perspective. Um, you know, I, I provided a couple of links around uh, people, you know, generating knowledge graphs based on BERT embeddings um, and things like that. Um, so, you know, there are a bunch of different approaches to this and Slava's background is definitely more in the semantic web um, side. Um, you know, I think that there's some sort of mediation that needs to be done where, you know, uh, what Slava, I think, is most passionate about is not the form of the implementation, but the fact that, like, you know, we need to extract that knowledge graph in some way in order to be useful, right? Yeah. Um, and so if it's the case that the skill sets of the people who are actually, you know, have the time to implement these things are more um, on the uh, natural language processing, uh, deep learning side, um, or just the applied ML, um, where they may not even have, you know, a full understanding of like the difference between BERT and word to vec or something like that, um, then it's a case that we need to project manage it in the right way so that those people can be productive, but we still achieve the yeah. goals, right? Yeah. Uh, 100% agree. And here's the challenge that I've been dealing for the past two weeks. It's the fact that we all come from such diverse, you know, experiences, backgrounds and skill sets that we barely understand each other. And, you know, there is definitely this communication gap and we're trying to bridge it through, you know, these calls. But yeah, like some people are introverted. Some people are extroverted. Some people understand some like higher level abstractions. Some people are very down to detail. And this, like I have the biggest challenge about trying to deliver the same thing to a thousand people in, in the same words and it's impossible. And, you know, sometimes I jump from like very high level things to detail things and it's just impossible. So the best way I'm thinking of solving it is through silos and these silos uh, basically, we can form one around this, um, you know, idea and project that you have in mind and try to bring up people that speak the same language or at least are close enough to speak the, about the same things and uh, just see what happens. Sure. Um, so I, I think I've, you know, expressed this before. My, my concern is with closed silos versus open silos. I think, you know, making it so that people who uh don't have the background uh to you know engage with something that's like super super math heavy or whatever um don't have to like read those messages is important um but still making it so that people you know who are interested in trying to gain that context you know they're able to um yeah. is awesome. i agree there's a balance to it and again like <laughs> i come from this two-week period where i've seen hundreds of people just jumping in and like being overloaded with stuff and that's why i'm i'm taking the side of like knowledge conservation first before you know opening up the flute gates but i i do agree we can actually be because it depends on the types of silos you know the current si a search engine silo is actually like i think it's a good idea that it's private because of the timing because most of the people that uh you know were exhaust exhausted after this first submission like they just needed time not to see all this craziness yep. and that was beneficial. But if we try to formalize something a little bit more structured and for the Monday to open up the food gates, let's do a, a public channel on that. Sure. Um, and another thing that I'll say is that, you know, my belief is that it's actually the case that, you know, this kind of, search engine knowledge graph, whatever you want to call it, thing Discovery that was Discovery engine, yeah. Um, uh, is really something that everybody can actually contribute to. Um, yeah. You know, the people who are currently doing, you know, task VT or task geo or whatever, um, 
the way that they're enriching the data sets right now is instrumental towards uh, getting things into the right format such that you know uh, this literature review is actually possible in the right way, right? Like yeah. uh, the Geo team, for example, if they can label uh, every paper with like which population it's actually relevant to, um, then that fits into the search engine such that you know uh, if someone uh, or knowledge engine um, <laughs> like if someone wants to see right like incubation time um or like estimates of uh are not then they can see what it is for different geographic populations right um and we actually know. did that in two attempts there were two tracks for actually three kind of dimensions that we were working with this we just haven't had enough time basically extracting geo stuff from the clinical trials where they happened and putting that as a metadata, but also geo of where the paper came from in terms of the country. And, you know, this is the like clinical trial uh, type of layer, but then two dimensions of the actual location of trial and location of paper. So I fully agree that would be amazing in terms of enriching the current data set. And I think that's actually what Slava wants to do. Yeah. Um, and like similarly, uh, you know, Christine has expressed interest in uh, trying to uh, focus on this initiative of splitting papers into the sections and uh, potentially processing each section separately, right? Like understanding that like uh, results and discussion might mean the same thing um, in some cases, but not in other cases. Um, that kind of contextual grammar um, is uh, very important. Um, but uh, you know, I've talked a little bit about this idea of uh, using that type of splitting of sections to trigger different uh, DAGs or pipelines. Um, mm -hmm. Where, you know, for example, a prior art section or a literature review that happens within the paper or a server survey paper um, can be used really easily to well, not easily, but uh, could be very useful for establishing things like oh, like this other paper is actually outdated. Like it's actually the case that the estimate there um, is wrong as proven by this paper. Um, you know, there's a lot of papers that are responses like refuting another paper. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, building that kind of conditional graph of like what is the structure between papers both in time and in relation to each other as like, you know, a citation network. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that can be done with, you know, splitting up the sections and treating them differently and applying different, you know, subspecialties of, ma of machine learning to those things. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether it's specifically like deep learning based, uh, vector embedding or, you know, some of these approaches around like HTTP LDA and topic modeling and clustering and things like that. Um, they all have their place in this pipeline to enrich the data in the right way. And that's why I was so excited about the ARC challenge is because the framework that Francois Cholet outlined is essentially that. It's the fact that we don't have to have like, a, like we don't have to build AI that is skill. We have to build a system that is able to generalize concepts and apply various variations of skills be it deep learning, be it, you know, some, uh, you know, mark of chains or stuff like that. And that's the beauty of the actual, like, knowledge producing system. Yep. Um, I mean, it's still going to be the case that any of these systems are going to be, you know, if they're generalized, they're going to be less powerful than the yep. specialized one. Um, but we're not there yet. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, building an ensemble model or, you know, uh, applying different pipelines to different parts of uh, the paper or, you know, uh, applying okay. multiple. This pipelines. is actually what we can easily explain and get people excited about. Yep. Because that is the very easy to understand concept that leads to all the amazing things that you've, you've tried to explain. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of why I had wanted to hop on a call with you yesterday so that I could, you know, unpack these things for you. Um, uh, I had been, you know, most of the Slack chats that I put out so far are more, you know, abstract uh, talking about a specific thing within the search engine call or things like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I totally see the value in, you know, making this more accessible to people and I'm happy to help with that Let's process. Let's do that. I think that's the first step. And yeah, I, I apologize that I wasn't able to jump on the call. It's just that there are so many people that message me, hey, like we should do a call. And I, yep. 
my life is basically one giant call. <laughs> I, I get it. I mean, again, like I worked at Palantir, so I embedded with clients. And so I'd sometimes spend entire weeks on client sets and basically be at their, you know, uh, at their every beck and call uh, for a week at a time. Um, so uh, yeah, so yeah. Let's, let's do that. Like, I think that's uh, a very good way to approach the problem. And from then, when, uh, from there, we're, we'll unbundle all of these things and you know linked graph and all of these relationship uh producing uh, networks and yeah i think whatever we can do to bridge the gap between you know people like you and slava and engage people like brendan um you know that's that's going to be the key yeah i mean it's definitely the case that you know <laughs> brendan seems like a hyper productive individual <laughs> extremely and, and, productive <laughs> It's, it's, you know, making sure that he's being productive in the right direction, right? Um, yeah. So uh, I think, you know, uh, providing the right frameworks is really important. And, you know, that's part of why I was, you know, uh, pushing on like reorganizing Slack and things like that as well. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, again, like there are so many talented people here. Um, you know, uh, I wish that I had you know, even a tenth as many people working on my project. Um, but you know, it's, well, it's, now you have it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's the stuff that I'm working on is very much the, you know, causal inference, variational bays, like, uh, knowledge management, various other like graph structures and things like that. So, um, you know, I'm hoping that some people get interested in that and can help contribute, um, as you know, these efforts start to, uh, become synergistic. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, it, there's been a iteration process within Corona Y. It's kind of been like watching a lean startup, like kind of you know pivot every two days of like. Good day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, definitely sub pivots within the groups of every day. Um, yeah, we we were joking that we're building an airplane while flying in it. Yeah, I mean, again, I think that uh, epidemiology is actually more complicated than than rocket science. Um, so. Uh, uh, that's oversimplifying things, um, yeah. but uh, that helps. That helps, uh, you know, communicate it a little bit uh, better on a scale. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I think beyond that, you know, uh, there's definitely a lot more spec work in my mind that needs to be done. I think that the organization thus far has kind of over optimized for getting things done quickly. Um, mm -hmm. before thinking. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, the Kaggle deadline, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying that we have a ton of time before the next deadline, um, but it's also the case that, you know, I think a lot of people have started to internalize that this is something that could be, you know, extremely useful outside of the context of Kaggle. And so, you know, uh, use the deadline as a way to keep people motivated, but don't feel beholden to that deadline as much um, and make sure that, you know, you're doing the right things as opposed to just doing things. Um, uh, I think, you know, having spent a lot of time at startups, I've seen so many startups like work really, really hard and build something really incredible from the technical perspective, but not, you know, recognize Useful. how this fits into a larger e ecosystem. Yeah, I come from startup world too. So the, the last six years of my life was making sure that startups build the right thing. And yeah, because I come from the, I, I co-founded the Venture Studio here in LA and I basically wrangle entrepreneurs for a living. I call yep. it that. And we produce eight, 10 startups per year or produced. I'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen to early stage startup uh, ecosystem now, but that's, that's basically my, my main job. And I think that's why the, you know, Corona Y exists now because I was able to operate in this extreme uncertainty and tried to bridge this structure together to engage people. And yeah, like that's definitely something that I see more and more people willing to commit to. And we just need to properly frame it around, you know, useful things. Yeah. Um, I think that kind of brings up another point around kind of humility. Um, you know, something that as I've like tried to bring this up with some other people who are, you know, it, incredibly skilled you know they end up watching some of the daily calls and things like that um I, i've definitely heard and felt myself that you know uh some of the 
kind of excitement around, you know, building something incredible has bled into the point where, you know, uh, it's like a little bit of overconfidence. Um, <laughs> it's like, you know, we're building something that's never been built before, but really it's the case that, you know, uh, no one's applied it to this domain or with this model of a team, but it is the case that a lot of the things that, you know, people are trying to build now um, have been built in different ways. And so it's, you in know, different it's, ways, yeah. That's, that's the shoulders that you're standing on as opposed to being like, hey, we're like, you know, this incredible, incredible team, which, you know, we all know we are an incredible team, but like communicating in the right way such that, you know, uh, people realize that, you know, it's not just kind of a cult, um, but more, <laughs> you know. A, that, that's a great way of saying it. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I think even uh, you'd mentioned Ray Dalio in, in the stand-up call and like, uh, it's kind of the same way that people think about Bridgewater, right? Like you've got the people who are Bridgewater believers and are like, oh yeah, like they're doing incredible things. And then you've got the people who are like, it's a cult. Um, and uh, so I think having humility uh, kind of yeah. uh, in the way that Slava has humility, right? Like yeah. he's an expert. Um, and that's the balance. That's the organic balance that I envision being, you know, a self-emergent, right? There is, there is me that keeps hyping up people, but then there is Slava that is like, that's simple. Like, that's already existing. Like, I can do it. <laughs> you know, things like that. Just being humble, being very blunt. Uh, and by the way, that psycholinguist Mark guy is kind of the bad cop and very, like, upfront and, and blunt about these things. Uh, unfortunately, he has uh, his PhD uh, coming up, so he's uh, not dedicating as much time as I would love him to do. But he's kind of the person that also brings in the balance. And there are a couple of these like e extremely healthy, pessimistic people, you know? Yep. <laughs> I mean, my, my second role in my life is really being the pragmatist or pessimist, um, you know, telling people, no, that's not reasonable or no, like we should be yeah. doing it. Right. Um, but I think, you know, as much as possible um, for you, I think that it would be useful as a leader to, you know, try to incorporate some of these other perspectives into yeah. how you communicate. Um, I, where, agree. You know, um, I think, especially in terms of uh, getting epidemiologists to actually interact with the team right now, um, being very grounded and being like, hey, we know that we're not gonna be able to like solve all of your problems. We think that we have something that would be able to help you. Can we talk about this, um, you know, and uh, get feedback as to whether this is exactly what you need or if we need to design things a little bit differently. We're not epidemiologists, we're not subject matter experts and we understand why that means that we can't do X, Y, and Z. Um, but we do have this type of expertise and we think that means that we can help support you in this way, right? Um, being Let able me to ask you, do, do you have a network of epidemiologists that you consider that cluster of, you know, people that we can help the most? Yeah, um, I mean, the problem is that most of those people are the exceptionally busy ones. Um, <laughs> Like pretty much every epidemiologist right, right now um, who's like a card carrying epidemiologist is, you know, either employed by a government um, or scrambling to, uh, you know, put out some sort of study or, you know, is involved with uh, coordinating clinical trials or maybe they're, uh, you know, like a Mark Lipsitch or someone like that who's, uh, you know, trying to make sure that the communication about uh, the epidemic and pandemic is actually, you know, healthy um, in terms of how the public perceives it because, you know, it's this constant struggle of combating misinformation and disinformation from um, all sorts of different Conspiracy things. theorists and all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's, it's not even that. I think, you know, in my view, a lot of the most harmful things are actually, you know, people who do have an epidemiology background, uh, but are not putting that careful level of scrutiny into a given yeah. paper. And they're like, oh, like this means that like it's likely that you know uh, there are ten times more asymptomatic people than we previously thought, right? Especially considering the. Uh, are you familiar with the concept of ergodicity? In yeah, I mean, it's it, like this is a completely non-ergodic uh, system, right? Like you've got it's non-stationary. It's uh, mean. It's like you've got noise priors that are completely changing in time. Any intervention that the government makes um, is going to change the distribution. You know, there's also self-organization that changes distribution because people are afraid, right? Like, uh, you know, people are actually conscious, unlike, you know, 
most bacteria like <laughs> or things on that scale, right? Um, there's decision making. Um, there's uh, you know variances in like uh, uh, attitude towards governments in different places, right? Like you've got South Korea being super compliant, and you've got uh, you know Ohio going out and rioting, right? Um, so like there's so many different ways that people are interpreting each thing, and so uh, a lot of the epidemiologists that I've come to respect the most. Um, are really focused on that communication aspect, that kind of public health aspect. Um, and then another set of really respectable people are focused on the health economics of um, health e economics is basically this uh, more causal inference related thing where it's like, okay, if we implement this change, how will that change the course of the disease? Um, should we be investing a bunch of money into this type of test or this other type of test? Like how will that scale? Like understanding all of these trade-offs um, and like all of that is, you know, like basically the most important thing that we can do right now, because, you know, even if we did have perfect modeling of the disease and- uh, Which is you know, not possible, let's be honest. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely not possible. Even if we did have that, then it's still the case that we don't have perfect modeling of people and people are gonna react differently. And so, uh, and the entanglement and the fact of the people reacting to the model would change the model completely. Yeah. So, um, like there's a complex systems researcher, uh, Laurent uh, Hibert Dufresne um, in UVM, who uh, he and a couple of other researchers have been uh, uh, working on projects around uh, kind of uh, coexisting in, uh, contagion. So the idea that like. Uh, both parasitic and uh, reinforcing contagion of, um, you know, how social dynamics uh, actually change a, uh, a viral structure based on the fact that they themselves can be viral, right? Like uh, yeah. the word of mouth information that like we need to wear masks, for example, or um, different things will diffuse through the network at different rates and those will interact in, you know, nonlinear and complicated ways. Um, yeah, some complex stuff and definitely like the majority, like you would be surprised how many statisticians are not familiar with ergodicity and you would be oh, yeah, surprised. No, I mean, <laughs> it's, I'm not surprised by that at all because I, I know that like there's a video of uh, someone going around to a statistics conference and asking people to define p-values and like something like 80% couldn't give an actually accurate answer. Um, and so, yeah, like uh, really it's, you know, you've got the applied people, you've got the, you've got the theoretical people, um, and they don't always see eye to eye. And, uh, you know, uh, there's people who really just want to, uh, move things forward. So they'll, you know, be like, oh, uncertainty. Oh, well, oh, like, you know, uh, confounder. Oh, well, oh, like this process is non-stationary. Oh, well, right. Like, I don't know. I did peer review of a paper from, uh, this uh, guy who's the head of machine learning at uh, Boston Children's Hospital um, the other week. And uh, he, the paper that one of his students put out um, was a time series analysis um, and correlation analysis, but both things were going up and to the right. And so it was of course the case that it was correlated very highly. Um, and, you know, I, I tried to interact with him and, uh, you know, at first he was like, oh, we, we handled this. And then I was like, no, he didn't. Like, here's why he didn't handle it. He just stopped responding because he's like, I have to get back to my other research. <laughs> um, yeah, so. but, and, and that's actually something that I feel we are, uh, have emergent in our community is the fact that that the code of conduct that you accept that you're wrong by, by default. And I hope it'll, it'll propagate once we scale this. But I think that's a crucial missing piece from any existing organization structure or, you know, research yep. institutions. I mean, uh, for what it's worth, uh, I don't know if it's still one of the internal values, but uh, uh, Palantir had as an internal value, uh, uh, strong convictions um, held weekly. So the idea that you believe something very strong to, so as to motivate yourself to, you know, try to figure it out. But then as soon as you find out that you're wrong, you move on, right? Yep. Uh, and yeah, I think that that kind of belief is really powerful towards any of these kind of open science initiatives um, where you've got, you know, more diversity of, of uh, perspective and background than a lot of these academic institutions will. Um, you know, you and more, more chances uh, to be wrong. 
you know? Yeah. yeah, you won't have the same level of expertise. Like it's not the case that any of us have been, you know, reading the literature in, you know, the uh, MERS and SARS-1 uh, like related stuff since it's been happening and understand like how that understanding has changed over time. Um, but we do have, you know, other sorts of domain expertise and understanding how that fits in um, uh, can be, you know, ex extremely useful. Yeah, I agree. Well, great stuff. Like I, I came to this call with uh, way less expectation of having a sync, to be honest. But I feel, um, you know, eighty percent uh, synced, uh, and that's because like we've discussed so many complex things that I can't claim that I understand all of them. Like I, I barely understand uh, stuff that you're talking about, but I feel that we have some alignment. So to summarize, I'll, I'll post the recording of this call. I'll try to uh, formulate, how, how do we call this channel? What's... Um, I, like what channel? Like you mean a Slack channel? Yeah, the Slack channel just to streamline communication because I do not want to keep it in the search engine one. Like it's definitely separate. Um, I do want to centralize it around this ensemble type of approach. And I mean, uh, org structure, um, it kind of fits in there. Right? Like it's the more technical version of org structure. It's like, okay, we, we have a product that we want to build and we know vaguely what that product is going to look like and we need to unpack what that means in terms of what the structure of the organization needs to be yeah um i don't know it's okay it's, oh. so oh. i'll create that channel i'll do annotations for this call because i feel we've we've unpacked a lot of interesting things that will be hard to understand without some context so and let's try to sync uh if not tomorrow uh maybe monday uh, tomorrow, we, I, I plan to have a little bit more like relaxed situation in, in Slack and just uh, have more hangout type of calls versus yep. uh, technical ones, just because I, I feel the need for that, especially for the people that were working on the, on the, this rushed deadline. Yep. Um, but yeah, let, let's see what happens. I'm excited. I mean, uh, I'll mention that I do have a day job still, so. Uh, <laughs> we all do, we all do. Uh, as far as Monday goes, like evening is definitely better for me. Um, yeah. And in terms of my to-dos, uh, I will start to put together like a loose explainer of uh, kind of the uh, diversity of epidemiology um, yeah. and like how we might be able to help some of these specific people um, as well as uh, try to like put together a one or two pager around like how these different things fit together um, Perfect. in much less technical language. <laughs> Perfect. And it, it's tough. Just do your best and we'll jump in and try to, to help. Sure. Um, right. I mean, happy for all these documents to be collaborative. Um, that's kind of the goal with all of these things, right? So. Yeah. And it's amazing. You know, you, you create a document, you come back to it in one hour and it's filled. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> pretty cool all right, all right. Uh, sounds well, good man i hope that you managed to get a little bit more than three hours of sleep tonight um i hope to <laughs> i'm determined i yeah. had to do the same last night like after i think i had seven or eight nights in, in a row of like two to three hours and was like yeah i need at least four and a half so i gave myself yeah. four <laughs> super important especially in the fact that we're we're living in pandemic right now like yeah. that's real so we we have to take care of our health that's for sure. I have not left my apartment building um, other than, you know, going to my backyard for 33 days now. Uh, so oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, things are very intense in Brooklyn. Yeah. All right, man. Thank you so much for, for spending time on this. And yeah, I'm excited. Let's see what happens next. Um, yeah. Typically uh, it takes two, three days for things to propagate. So it, let's see. Like, <laughs> I mean, even just taking the time to watch a third of this video will be more free time than most people have. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks, man. Have a good one. You too. Bye.